Hello, viewers. Welcome to It Depends podcast. This is the first podcast we are recording for the year of 2022. By the way, 2022 sounds like 2020 TOO. So it's like, we, <laughs> no, we, we, no, yes, we don't want to go there. So, <laughs> so we want 2022 to start on a fresh note, uh, on an upbeat note. So we are doing this, this recording. I am so glad to have two of my closest friends, amazing uh, thought leaders from the industry participate in this very first uh, podcast of the year. My name is Sanjeev Mohan, and I am representing uh, my company, Sanjmo Advisory Services. With that, let me uh, hand over to Amy. And uh, Amy, please do us the honors. Yes. Uh, so Amy Hodler, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank you, Sanjeev, uh, for uh, hosting this uh, conversation. Uh, my background is in uh, graph theory, uh, data science, and I am now an AI evangelist. That is great. Thank you. And Sumit? I guess my turn. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Sanjeev. Thank you for um, inviting me to this. This is great to be you know, part of the first, um, the first uh, podcast of the year. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I work for on uh, machine learning uh, research as part of my Gartner work. Um, you know, I kind of uh, do all things machine learning, you know, from end-to-end -end, uh, processes, uh, deployments, implementations. Uh, but then there are a few topics which are my favorite. Um, look at a lot of the responsibility AI topics, explainability, uh, bias detection, uh, you know, just uh, responsible use of uh, machine learning uh, solutions. Um, and then... A uh, few other areas where I'm very interested is, is the operationalization because I come from a lot of uh, many years of project implementation. So um, I guess I'm much closer um, to actual implementation. So very pragmatic on that when it comes to implementations. Um, and uh, a lot of open source uh, technologies as well because that's really where I see innovation come through first. Yeah, so that is one of the great things I like about both of you is that you're not just uh, talking about machine learning in abstract, you're actually practitioners. So Sumit, you've, you've delivered projects, you've been a very early proponent of machine learning and built amazing frameworks for MLOps, open source, the entire explainable AI, you've done uh, some groundbreaking work. And Amy is actually a published author of uh, in the space of graph databases, graph algorithms, Spark, and machine learning. And uh, my my go-to people when it comes to learning anything about graph and machine learning, this is you're the ones I go to. So with that, so let's just uh, jump straight in. So I uh, I want to start with, with the two of you, uh, Amy, maybe if you want to get us started. I want to just do a rewind into the year that we just finished, 2021. What were some of the, the major trends that you saw in the machine learning space? Yeah, I, I was uh, thinking about that as the year's wrapping up. And it's interesting, I think in the, the kind of the AI ML space, um, 2021, there was a lot of, I think, mega trends, I would say that is um, socioeconomic, political, um, that affected technology and AI. And that's been kind of interesting to see that. Um, and I would say, unfortunately, the number one um, for 2021, I think is this erosion of trust in general. And so we can think about what happened with the pandemic, um, you know, being unsure about decisions, um, January 6th, uh, Facebook uh, issues. So there's just a lot that really hit us, I think, as a society that impacted AI decisions and discussions. So I think there's a lot of really healthy discussions going on right now about different types of governance in uh, machine learning that kind of has that, you know, erosion of trust as, as one of the um, uh, one of the things that has pushed it, a uh, call for guidelines um, of different types uh, in both data and machine learning uh, and AI. A skepticism, I would say, data everywhere, like anything to do with data, people in machine learning, people are starting to say, is this the right data? Is there bias in the data? Do I understand the background of how it was collected? Um, is this too, too little data to base this decision on? 
And that's also, I think, where explainable AI is also um, becoming uh, more important because people have that erosion of trust. Uh, and I think we've just started to dip our toes in that. So that, to me, was a big thing in 2021. Um, I also think the system level breakdown, so things that we saw in supply chain, healthcare systems, HR systems, you know, the great resignation, uh, and this recognition that we have to kind of be looking at things, and I think that hits machine learning as well, more holistically, uh, kind of more as an ecosystem. And so how do I have predictions that include context, you know, and graph embeddings becoming interesting for, for a lot of people? How do I um, look closer at the people, the processes, the technology to get AI into production, which I think actually leads us into, I would say, ops, all the things. So we, people are talking about operations a lot right now, uh, and I don't think that's going to end. And so this you know, erosion of trust, breakdown of systems, people want to look at how do I productionize things more flexibly uh, and more humanely for people. And so this rise of ML ops this last year has been, I think, part of, you know, part of that um, wanting to productionize things. And so I kind of see these like huge mega trends that have kind of pushed us in certain directions in, in AI, which is kind of interesting to think about how those things link together. Yeah. Wow. Erosion of trust. I love that term. <laughs> and uh, yes, a lot happened and COVID. Uh, we're still dealing with that. Um, Sumit, how about yourself? Yeah. Uh, no, I completely agree with what uh, what Amy said, and I'm seeing. I, I would say that I'm seeing similar things. Mm -hmm. I trust is definitely important. Um, you know, we see in pretty much every industry and every space where there's a human interaction, mm -hmm. that you know yeah. AI adoption is is a challenge. Yeah. Where if you know if the users don't trust it. If the, and it doesn't have to be end customer, it has to be internal business users. Right. If they are not trusting what AI can deliver to them, what recommendations are coming, then you know, they are very hesitant to use it. Right? So that's, that's definitely you know, a big topic uh, that we are seeing you know, more and more conversations um, through, uh, you know, through 2021. And I'm hoping that's going to be a more, uh, more visible mm -hmm. uh, and critical piece of uh, requirements that companies will look, look to implement, right? Just how to um, enhance the trust in the system, in, in AI. I, I have a question, I think, for Sumit, maybe. <laughs> if yeah. you don't mind me asking a question. Yes, uh, no, please. It's, yeah, go for it. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've been wondering about is this um, thinking about trust and also um, uh, productionizing things and, and ML ops and actually ops in general. Like this desire to drive intelli intelligence down into the stack whether you're talking about um, infrastructure as code or driving intelligence into data with like an intelligent metadata or, you know, whatever, a knowledge graph, whatever you might be doing there. But that also kind of begs that balance of trust and the human element, you know, domain expert automation. How do you, you know, how do you balance those? I'm wondering what, what you've seen um, this past year and that kind of balance. Oh, I, I think there's a lot of uh, technology that's coming up in that space as well. I mean, this is a great question. Right, where on one side we are looking to have the human, um, you know, still managing and you know doing a lot more productive work, but at the same time we also want to automate, you know, as much as possible and bring in more of uh, intelligence into the process. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole debate about, you know, is it really intelligent or is it more augmentation? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say that in some uh, segments of the process, right, like um, you know where uh, it's supporting the business decisions. Right, you're really trying to augment, uh, yeah. augment the end user. Right, it could be an intelligent recommendation, but it's really trying to augment the end user. Right, mm -hmm. the other parts is we're trying to automate processes, mm -hmm. and and say okay, you know, data quality is hard, and you have millions and millions of rows of data, and it's been hard for many years and still is. Right, so how can we bring in, uh, you know, more ideas and more technologies, um, to, you know, maybe resolve some of those issues better. Right. So I think it's it's a tough balance, right? It's a tricky balance, really. That how do you trust it? I mean, what what do you think? I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it it would be interesting if we if we called it um if if it wasn't called artificial intelligence, but it was called assistive intelligence or something, yeah. uh, or augmenting intelligence, it would probably be easier for us to uh to to just have 
you know, maybe better conversations because it wouldn't, you know, you would assume that there was still, you know, human in the loop. I think human in the loop is so important, um, you know, for if you, I think as you actually very well put it is, you know, think of me as augmenting what humans need to do uh, and the decisions. I think anything where you need a domain expertise that, you know, that's where you kind of want the the humans in the loop. And I think the, you know, to your point about augment, augmenting what um, teams need to do, uh, the, the more we can do, and I think about this with staffing and making things easier for staffs as well, is it more you can um, get the, you can make, make it easier for them to, to make good decisions, take the repetitive tasks off their uh, plate, uh, especially with just f- trouble finding staffing and getting up to staff right now uh, in general is, is going to be really important. There's some interesting things that are going on as far as like even just like data cleansing and improving that uh, to get that off of, you know, data scientists or data engineers plates. Um, so I think we'll probably see that through next year is just this idea of how do you augment what we're already doing versus replacing what people are doing. Sanjeev, uh, you have been very close to data for many, many years, right? And, and anywhere where data is being used. Um, you know, I know you are you want to ask us all these tough questions, <laughs> but, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so the tables have turned. So, so you yes. get to ask me questions. And, you know, as an analyst, there's so much we can talk about. I, I really think, the, I, by the way, I love this idea of rebranding AI as augmented intelligence. I think that should have been the right term uh, right from the beginning yeah. because you just cannot replace the domain expertise. You can replace, you can automate the statistical analysis of data. And that is where I see AI is a must have. The volume of, of the data that we are handling today is so large that it is manually impossible to do it. If we look at, uh, Amy, you mentioned data cleansing. How how many years, decades, have we tried to fix data quality problems and we failed at it? So in the past, what we did was we, we knew data quality is a problem. So uh, the, uh, the accountants and people would get together, collaborate on an Excel spreadsheet, uh, fix all the anomalies, and then give the report to the CFO. The next day CFO would say, here are our numbers. I don't think you can do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you can do it, but you won't be competitive at this point, if you do this kind of manual fixing of data. So, so we need AI to do the baselining uh, automation, do the discovery, find the sensitive data, and then do human cura- uh, curation on top. And I think that's the winning formula. Mm. So, uh, yeah, is that is that what you're seeing, uh, Sumit? Uh, when yeah, you absolutely, talk- absolutely, completely agree with Sanjeev. Um, it, it kind of reminds me, I apologize, I was just gonna say it kind of reminds me of like the Google or uh, GitHub's um, co-pilot um, software to kind of do autocomplete, I, and I'm probably not giving it justice, but learning an autocomplete of code. It's like, how do you take this repetitive template stuff, you know, out of um, out of the ML task? Because it's just, we, we may have done it in other areas of um, software engineering, but we just haven't done it yet in, in uh, ML. So I'm yeah. sorry, Sumit, you were going to say yeah, something. No, that was a, that's a really good example. Um, I mean, I think that's where AI can contribute a lot just to mm-hmm. you know, make it faster. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking you know, a little bit backwards where uh, there was a time where you were using a lot of, everybody was using a lot of SQL right? just to get data and make it go from A to B. And then we had uh, these um, you know, workflow engines where you have graphical designers and you can drag and drop, and now you can build those solutions in much faster, right? And now with AI augmentation, you know, it's kind of the next phase of that evolution, right? Where a lot of that can happen uh, you know, even faster. So you, know, you can, I guess developers can focus on more important things, uh, more value additions than just you know, having to write boilerplate code. So, so I have a question on this. Do, do you see that, that the, the, the vendors or the market is doing what we call AI washing, where everything is, is being branded as AI enabled? Uh, 
how 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 can uh, how can we distinguish whether it's truly AI enabled or it's just rules based? You know, because it's all black box. You know, so anyone can say AI enabled data preparation, but what defines it? Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, if everything is AI enabled, then one, it loses its value because the, how do you distinguish? And, and, uh, and two, people start uh, mistrusting it. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, it's a, uh, AI is a hype. And sometimes we hear from people saying, yeah, AI is a hype. You don't really need AI. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Can I go first, Amy? Please, yes, yes. Right. Please. So, so there was a story, uh, was it last year or the year before, uh, where there was an analysis done that most of the websites or companies that are saying, you know, having .ai as the, um, the domain is not really using any AI inside. I think it was like more like 60%, 70%, maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely, I mean, it's a very valid question, Sanjeev. Right? How do you know really that, you know, are they using AI? But I also see that AI has, um, you know, many different um, forms, right? Different domains, the way you can use it. So it's not just about um, machine learning, right? We have a lot of natural language processing um, and a lot of technology expanding expansion happening in that space. Uh, you know, we have the GPT GPT three models. We had BERT. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of technology innovation happening uh, with transformers. Right. So so that's one space where I think uh, there's a lot of uh, innovation happening, and it's good to know uh, that from a vendor perspective, that what is the technology being used uh, underneath. Right. The other space where I'm seeing is uh, this intersection of um, um, computer vision um, and, yeah, and other tech and deep learning techniques as well, combined with a lot of the industrial solutions, right? Especially you know when you start thinking about things at the edge. Um, so solutions like predictive maintenance, where um, you know it could be a utility which is trying to find out that you know when do they need to um, you know do maintenance on their uh, turbines at yeah. a power plant. Or it could be, um, you know, a fleet owner uh, who want to find out that when they, when they, when do they need to, uh, you know, do an oil change on their trucks, right? Uh, so it's kind of something that's happening across industries. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, more, um, you know, uh, uh, you definitely want to know that are you getting the value um, and the savings uh, that you think, right? But and then there's a conversation has to happen that you know what is the underlying technology. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that goes towards the trust aspect that we were talking previously, right? That how do you trust that solution? Yeah. I, I kind of wonder if it, how much it really matters that, that people are AI washing. I remember when, um, you know, the, the cloud term first came about, I'm probably dating myself, uh, and, and people were saying, oh, it's just utility data center. It's just, yeah. you know, what it's, does it really matter that it's coming over the wire? And it, it, it did in some sense, because it really changed, you know, uh, pricing models, uh, you know, uh, how people actually could deploy things. So it did make, have a big impact. Uh, but I, in the AI sense, I, it does it matter? You can either talk about the specific technology, or you can talk about um, an AI, an augmented intelligence, um, a kind of a delivery system, or the way the services are provided. And when I think about um, AI, uh, I'm, I'm going to start using aug augmented intelligence. Yes, um, yeah. yes uh, we've we've agreed that's the new term. Yes. But when I think about that, I think more about the goal, and the goal is to usually to make some kind have some kind of decision that is heuristic and is able the way humans make decisions is some kind of heuristic. Uh, in it because you can't be completely rules based and do things um, as fast as like humans can do and with the flexibility. So uh, heuristics are important. And then I think um, having some kind of contextual, at, at least an attempt at contextual um, intelligence or awareness as well. So for, for me, if it, if it combines those elements, uh, do I really care? you know, exactly what the definition is, uh, you know, down to the details. I'm not, I'm not sure I do. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? You know, when you said, does it even matter? It actually reminded me of this 20 year old article in, in Harvard Business Review, does IT matter? Oh. <laughs> and I was like, certainly I had a flashback to that. And, and we all <laughs> were up in the arms. We are like, no, what do you mean? I, of course, IT matters. But I see a point, you know, it's like uh, we can spend time 
uh, either we can waste our time trying to parse and, and define the semantics, or like Sumit has given so many examples where AI is all around us. You know, our emails are run by AI behind the scenes. Otherwise, we will be inundated with so much noise that we won't even be able to read our emails, you know, if AI wasn't at work behind the scenes. So, so I, I, I think AI is very much alive and kicking um, and we should probably not focus so much on semantics. We should focus on the <clears throat> examples of where it has delivered and what more can we do with it. Yeah. So, so in that, would it be uh, so? What are your thoughts on the whole AI winter concept? Uh, can you explain, like, what is AI winter? And you know, uh, we say we we went through it. Some people are, are saying again. I think this is more of like uh, a narrow view in my mind of AI. But I'm just curious, what's your thought about AI winter? And is that even a thing? Well, why don't you go ahead, Sumit? All right. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Um, so AI winter, um, I, I mean, when I read about AI winter, there have been you know, a few incidents where a few instances where they said, you know, it's been AI winter. And, and I, I tend to agree there, right? Where, um, you know, winter usually is a kind of a signif signifies, you know, everything is frozen. Not much is happening. Mm -hmm. and, and that's precisely what happened in um, within the space of AI over, you know, like the 80s and 90s, where we didn't really hear much about um, um, AI as a technology doing a lot of things, right? There was a lot of discussions around, um, I guess, e-commerce or, you know, using use of web, but not really so much about AI. And, and uh, I think uh, the few reasons uh, that this happened, one is hype, right? That, you know, over-promising that AI can be, you know, just, just the term AI, right? Artificial intelligence that at some point we can have this, um, you know, AGI or artificial general intelligence where AI can do pretty much everything, right? It always reminds me about uh, the series Star Trek, you know, where, you know, they had, you know, you can just speak to a computer or, you know, you have, uh, you know, amazing technology. Um, so it felt like science fiction. Uh, and I think the hype was a big contributor to that. And, um, you know, maybe the funding wasn't happening because AI wasn't delivering so much, right? So there were multiple factors that was happening. The research was focused somewhere else on other topics, which they, you know, the researchers felt is more um, relevant. Um, but the end result was that, you know, AI suffered or AI research suffered. But I would say that, you know, last 10 years have just been amazing uh, for AI, right? There has been so much innovation, um, so much uh, financial investments, Right, that just you know amazing growth. Uh, so many people um, who are looking to you know work on AI solutions. Right, a lot of university courses. Pretty much every university has a course on data science or AI. So I think from the from the point of view from you know people and process and technology, this just you know last ten years have been amazing. Hmm. Um, I was reading somewhere they said it's we are in the AI spring. AI yeah, spring, so, <laughs> okay, as opposed to winter, we are in AI yeah. spring. So I think there's still, in my opinion, there's still ways to go. Uh, there's always risks, right? That if we continue to overhype and people think that AI is magic, yeah, um, then you know this becomes that gap between what AI can do and mm -hmm. what the expectations of from AI are. Mm -hmm. I had similar experiences when I was working on projects before, you know, uh, in the past, where not everybody understood what AI was or what it can do. What, and even, you know, not talking about general AI, just machine learning, what machine learning can do. Mm -hmm. So I think I felt a big part of uh, working on machine learning projects or AI projects is uh, really about education. Mm -hmm. So making sure that, you know, everybody who's a uh, stakeholder in that implementation or a project, right, gets a decent understanding of what AI can do. Right? and what the expectation should be and how does the technology work. So I think education is a big, big part of, you know, making sure that, you know, it stays, it keeps on being successful. Hmm. That's great. Uh, Amy, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I, I really like what, um, what you had to say, Sumit. And I think that reminds, there's like two elements of that that, um, that come to mind. The first is, um, well, I'll, I'll say first, I don't see an AI winter coming right right now, uh, even, even though I no longer know what that term means uh, or I can <laughs> define it. But uh, 
that uh, I think I think what's different now is um, there's more tangible business impact. So that traction that Smith had, had talked about, there's more traction. Um, and I would say more savvy deployments. Um, I don't know if you remember, people used to talk about um, POC purgatory with machine learning projects where, you know, this, the team, you know, you'd have a data science team that would be given, you know, a chunk of money and say, do amazing things. Come back in six months when you've done something amazing. Like, what, what does that mean? Uh, and you would have, you know, some people very early in their career trying to figure out, I just have to do cool stuff. I don't know what it is. Uh, and I think that has shifted in the last few years where you have more savvy deployments, um, where people are tying, either, whether it's experimentations or actually POC to business outcomes. And I think as long as we are aligning, and I would say incremental AI <laughs> successes um, to predetermined measurable goals we're not going to have uh, an AI winner because we're we're going to see that you know measurable visible traction and business will keep investing in it. So I, I think that's that's first um, you know my my first gut feeling on that uh, and actually just seeing people deploying successfully. And um, the other thing is uh, something Sumit said about um, education being so important. Uh, it reminded me and talking about terminology at the beginning of this reminded me of seeing. Um, I saw Hillary Mason uh, on stage when she was the, the GM of, of machine learning at Cloudera. Um, mm -hmm. She's now uh, founded uh, a startup. But uh, I remember her saying on stage that our biggest challenge in AI and machine learning was terminology and being able to tell stories, having consistent language and having things that didn't sound like science fiction. And I thought that was a really, but she didn't know what the language should be. And I think that actually gets to a core part of the education is, you know, do we, um, do we have ways that we can talk about AI with common understanding between business and, you know, data scientists and, and users. Uh, and that also reminded me that they're just, I want to say just a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a, a publication of an image library for AI. Uh, it's better images of AI. Uh, and it's a non, I, well, it's .org. So I'm assuming it's nonprofit uh, where they have more realistic images uh, and iconography of AI. So it's not like the scary robot, you know, that's, that is, you know, if you Google, you know, image of machine learning, you get these like really you know, horrific or, or, you know, silly little robot. So they're trying to have more. And to me, that's part of the education process is these, you know, common realistic, you know, images and terminology we can, we can all use. Yeah. Amy, something you said really resonated where you said uh, predetermined uh, measurable goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's extremely important, right? For any, I mean, it's been extremely important for any project, um, but it's definitely more important for AI. Right, so that it doesn't, you know, get away from reality. And in the end, I think, you know, we're solving a business problem. Yeah. Right, so that, yeah. that I think should not deviate from that, that goal. Right. And the only way to achieve that is, you know, having those measurable goals. So, you know, completely agree with your point there. This is, this is really good. One of the questions I was going to ask later in the show, but we've already pretty much covered it, is like, what are some of the most successful com uh, companies doing in this space? And I think you've already addressed it, uh, addressed, which is, you know, demystify, do, don't make AI to be something bigger than it's supposed to be, have realistic expectations, and those expectations should be tied to a business outcome and then go uh, do it, prove the worth, and then iterate and add more use cases. Rather than, you know, uh, like I like the way you said, you know, here is some funding, go do cool things, which is, could mean anything, you know, so yeah. yeah, yeah. The other thing is, as far as like successful companies, and I'm curious if um, both of you have talked to, to companies um, with, I don't know if this is, I the both a, either a problem or you know a recipe for success is this difference between and especially the last year and a half between mm -hmm. collaboration um real collaboration versus noise and so uh, one of the things that you know talking to to people in different teams is 
you know, just more Slack messages is not going to, it does not equate collaboration. And so this idea of, you know, operational models that actually bring together teams. And I've seen co some companies do this really well uh, in the, the machine learning space where they're connecting their data scientists with their um, data engineer better with their, you know, tying it to the business goals, um, but having like an actual effort to have common terminology, common measures, um, you know, unified dashboards, even if they're not, you know, beautiful or what they're currently using, as opposed to these silos approach. That to me seems like a big, I, I noticed that teams that are really successful seem to have nailed down collaboration versus just like more alerts or more Slack or more messages. Like they kind of figured that out. So is there um, an issue with how do you ascribe value to your machine learning initiative or your overall AI initiatives? Uh, and I'm, I'm asking this because I get this question a lot for data catalogs. And Amy, I, I, tell, uh, uh, I tell people, my clients, if you look at how many Slack messages you get on, hey, what is the meaning of this data? Where do I find the, the source of truth or this kind of stuff? that volume, that noise needs to come down. And if that noise comes down in Slack, then you're doing something right. So, so it's kind of an indirect way of showing value of your data governance initiative. So same thing, you know, for machine learning initiatives, how, how does one ascribe value, either real dollar value or, you know, intangible value to that initiative? Yeah. So I, I've got some Amy. thoughts, but then I think I, I think you probably have more real world examples. So so I, unfortunately, what I've seen, I haven't seen people use the um, you know less alerts, less slack, um, mm -hmm. less questions as a way to show value of the machine learning yet. Um, but what it but it's it's the difference between what I hear people on the team talk about that are doing really well and the ones that aren't doing really well. And so that's so I think what you're I, I like that that idea as a measure most of the measures that I'm seeing have to do with like reduction in churn. Um, mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, I have better um, churn recommendation, uh, a better, um, you know, increase in uh, overall purchase, uh, you know, of services. And so I use that as my, you know, my recommendations doing better. So those are the measures that I usually see um, fraud, of course, you know, reduction or recovery of fraud uh, tied to more ML models out there. So those are the very, businessy um, mm -hmm. bottom line measures that I'm hearing people talk about, but I like this idea of measuring um, reduction in friction at work, you know, if yeah. you will. I, so I like that idea, but I haven't seen anybody do that. I don't know, Sumit, have you? Well, um, so, you know, there's the organizational structure that comes in, right? There's a Conway's law which says, you know, your processes get aligned with how your organization is structured. So I'm just, I was, you know, as, you know, Sanjeev and Amy, you guys were discussing, I was, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, how things have changed over the last three, four years. So I remember, you know, when I was doing my early projects, it was more strategic in nature, um, you know, where the thought was that, okay, can we just explore what we can do with AI, right? Um, do some proof of concepts, validate the technology, maybe, you know, demonstrate success with it. So the question of that, are we getting the right results and returns uh, for the investment wasn't there, mm -hmm. and, and and you know as part of a lot of the a lot of the interactions with the clients uh, as well, I, I see the same kind of um, uh, pattern, where three years back it used to be a lot more about uh, you know I want to do my first few proof of concepts right can I create my first ten models, and uh, I've seen that um, change a lot over the last two years where a lot of companies have moved from those first ten models to say, okay, I want to build my first 100 models, right? Yeah. And in some cases where they're saying, okay, I want to build my first 1,000 models or maybe more, mm -hmm. right? So there's been that um, a shift in terms of uh, scale, right? Mm -hmm. and, and with that, I guess, you know, the ones who are saying, okay, I want to build my 1,000 models, they, I'm sure they have cracked that, um, that puzzle mm -hmm. that, you know, how to keep track of these models. Um, are they delivering business value or not? Um, are they staying, you know, healthy and up to date or not, right? Uh, but I would say that's still a minority. Yeah. 
I was going to ask you that how many, what is the percentage of uh, people, roughly speaking, that you talk to that have maybe no models to <laughs> five to 10 models to 100 to 1000? What would, what would you say, rough estimate? Ah, oh, so that's a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, I guess a sampling um, problem there where I wouldn't say, I don't come across anyone who has no models. Right? No models. Oh, I, wow. know, I work yeah, on machine yeah, learning on AI, so it's probably yeah. a sampling issue. That's good. good. Um, on the other extreme where, you know, they have, you know, thousand or a few thousand models, mm -hmm. I would say that's probably, you know, uh, 5% or, mm -hmm. or less of the, you know, companies that we talk to. Um, more, um, I guess the bigger, the center of gravity is probably yeah. in that, you know, 10 to 100. Um, so that's where the majority of the organizations are. I see. Uh, they're trying to scale, uh, which is where, you know, MLOps has been a big uh, trend for us, for me, uh, at least. Right. Like where, um, you know, just being able to scale, right? There was this tweet uh, that I, you know, come across many times in presentations and, you know, different talks where they said, uh, it took about nine months or 11 months for a model to make it to production. Hmm. Right. And, and today, I think a lot of organizations trying to see that, can we get these models into production the same day or multiple times a day? Oh, wow. Right. So, so I, I think, you know, that um, the goals, you know, um, or the timelines, you know, have compressed a lot because organizations are realizing that there's a lot of business value to achieve from there. Right. Um, right. right. Yeah. Right. So, so that I think, and I think that's where it, you know, from it comes closer, you know, from hype to reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's still, it's still a lot to be done. I mean, this, this, you know, Amy, the, your point about uh, data silo or the silo within organizations. I mean, it's that's a valid thing. That's real. Right? Where you know, I've seen where data scientists say, "Okay, I'm building this solution," but nobody in business wants to use it, right? Or other way, mm -hmm. um, you know, where the business users say, "Okay, I need something," but they don't know how it can be done or who can do it. So that's a valid thing. I, th I think your your point about a lot of people being somewhere between you know tens or a few tens to a hundred is um, is kind of you know my feel as well when we start to talk to, to people, um, and I think it's the when they start getting closer to that hundred size uh, that they, they kind of have an oh crap moment mm -hmm. when they realize they can't keep up with. You know, it's it's the 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 idea that you're just going to create your model, throw it over the fence, and it'll live and be happy um, until you're you don't want to use it anymore. And then they realize there's this continual care and feeding, and that's where I think the ML ops. Why we're seeing you know part of the why we saw um, ML ops kind of rise this last year is that people are because we're starting to see that tipping point with more models, and you just you just can't hand you know, track and alert and update and retrain and, you know, check which one's better when you're at that hundred mark. It just, you, you know, your processes kind of fall apart. Hmm. And I think the other thing of that, that I think I'm thinking a lot about right now, and I don't think businesses are thinking a lot about yet is model and machine learning governance, hmm. um, because it's hard to validate and govern an artifact that keeps changing on you. So if you have, a, if you're learning a function, you know, if your machine learning model learns a function and it's out there in the real world and it takes your risk management team, you know, two months to validate something, by the time they validate it, it's out of date. So yeah. there's this, th that part, I don't think a lot of people have thought a lot about yet, um, but I'm, I guess maybe I'm jumping ahead. Maybe that's a late 2022 or 2023 mm. thing that we're going to be talking about. That is great. I mean, I, I like this as, as a prediction that uh, ML governance is going to increase in its prominence, uh, but more, more like the second half. Uh, because right now, MLOps is already a trend and MLOps is going to keep going up. So no question about that. Another thing that, uh, Amy, you had mentioned earlier when we were, when you were talking about a number of, of trends and you'd mentioned erosion of trust was a big one, uh, but you also mentioned something called graph embeddings. Can you throw some light on graph embeddings and see what is the trend there? What is it and what can we expect in 2022? Yeah, so um, graphs just 
you know, like just a quick one on one um, graphs are basically a way to represent um, how data points are connected. And there's a lot of information. If you think about um, the relationships between things, uh, can tell us a lot about um, the the context that things uh, occur in, and and they're very predictive. And so. It, you know, people naturally want to use those uh, more, but they can be very difficult to handle. So it's, they don't tend to look and feel like just rows of numbers. However, you can use a, you can use technology called graph embedding, uh, algorithms called graph embedding to basically smash that complex data structure into a, a vector, or you can think of it as just a row of, of numbers that you can then learn on. And why that's, was I think this last year you started to you more interest in people using it, and I think you'll see more people um, use that kind of technology and learning based on that is because that captures context. And if you think about how hard it's been to make predictions this last year or two, um, the more you can add in the context of your data, uh, the more you get a more holistic view of the data you're learning on. And that can only make your predictions better. And so that's that's why I think it's it's been a nascent trend for the last year or so. And I think that's just going to pick up more and has actually been pushed, accelerated more because of the pandemic and the difficulty in um, you know having good data to make predictions on. Okay, uh, um, great. So do you see, uh, do you come across graph embeddings? Any thoughts on that? I think graphs could be everywhere. I mean, graph has been there for a long time, but last, um, yeah. I would say, year or so, it's been, you know, it's become a little, it's become a lot more uh, visible, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a solution. Um, so that's, that's really promising. Uh, I mean, if we think about the current problem of supply chain challenges, mm -hmm. okay, just to be able to link uh, that, you know, where, yeah. uh, you know, the demand is going to be, where the supply is going to come from, what are the dependencies in between, you know, graph provides you the, that perfect data structure. That how to relate these, uh, you know, different, um, you know, and diverse uh, kind of uh, solutions, and and products, right? And mm -hmm. and and you know, know that causal relationship, that yeah. you know, some you know, a drought in Taiwan um, could cause a chip shortage worldwide, right? Who would have known that? Mm -hmm. So I think it's 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 a foundational um, solution, and um, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of graph. Um, especially in 2022. That is great. Uh, Amy, you would concur with that? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's been on the rise. It's, graphs have been around for a while, but it's been on the rise. And I think there's been some um, you know, fundamental shifts in uh, what vendors have been able to offer that just makes it more practical for people to actually use them um, either natively or in you know, other machine learning processes they have. And so as that has gotten better, and then I think the pandemic with the shift of information and need to innovate with analytics, that's kind of pushing people to look at different things. And um, something Sumit mentioned about uh, like the supply chain, I think using things like graphs will help people do uh, more journey analytics. So looking at, you know, not just again, an individual data point, but what's the customer journey? What's the product journey? What was the patient journey and do machine learning, not just on discrete points, but on like complete journeys, which is kind of exciting. And I don't think there's a lot of that going on yet, but you, you, the technology is there and you can kind of, you can see it coming. So, so with graph embeddings, is it fair to say that in the past, if, if somebody had deployed a graph database, they were able to do a lot of graph related use cases, but to do machine learning, some they had to extract it into maybe a CSV file or Parquet file, put it into a machine into a, a data science cluster, and then run a notebook on it. But with graph embeddings, you can bring that notebook experience part into the graph and push down the processing into the graph. Would you say? I I, I would say it's actually the other way around mostly okay. is that people are using the, the information they have from a graph and then putting it in a format that is machine le learning friendly mm -hmm. um, so that you can kind of feed that insight in that context into a, a machine learning process that's already up and going. So you don't, you don't do, you don't throw out what you're already doing, um, but you're just mm -hmm. adding that 
um, contextual intelligence to that. So, so we see there's a lot of movement where the data science work is being pushed down into the relational database or some of the modern databases. Uh, you know, so so you don't really uh, because as the volume of data goes up, you know, it becomes harder to build your output to be machine learning friendly and extract it. And maybe you may even have to pay egress costs and latency. Do you see uh, an intersection of machine learning with the graph where it's becoming one unifying? I think there's some really good technology that's very promising. Mm -hmm. uh, and you do see some of that uh, getting pushed down. Uh, but at the moment, the gravity seems to be in uh, other uh, ecosystems and tools. Um, that could shift, especially if you're doing a heavy a workload that's um, heavily tailored, you know, to like for you know for a graph or for anything else for that matter. If the if the workload's heavily tailored to one type of data structure, that you know that kind of makes sense. Um, but it's interesting. I I. It, there is also some very promising things like um, you know the graph neural networks that people are really excited about, uh, and and that's it's very promising. But practical, I don't know how much practical like uh, uh, you know tools there are in platforms. Thinking about hey, we don't want a science project. We want something that mm -hmm. you know that you can slip into what you're already doing. I guess that's what I see for probably. 2022 is still the bulk being moving to you know where other machine learning processes are happening, um, but that could that could shift um, depending on what what vendors are able to um, to offer. I don't know, Sumit, what what do you see out there? Oh, very similar, Amy. Very similar. Um, I mean, graph neural networks is something that we are starting to hear. Um, to hear. There's a lot more academic research, right? So a lot of focus is right now as part of that academic research, uh, which is you know many times just focused on a very specific scenario. Right. So to, to take it, and, and they're always, academic research is always early, right? uh, and the enterprise use of that is always, you know, a little bit lagging. So I think um, we're going to see some of that adoption into the um, tool sets that we're using, and then the enterprise use cases. Uh, and hopefully that's a good success story, maybe towards the end of 2022. Um, so, you know, really looking forward uh, to how, you know, graph and the graph, uh, you know, networks play out, uh, and you know, how it becomes more, um, um, useful. That is right. So, so we've been, you know, talking quite a bit about the the trends uh, or the predictions for 2022 uh, in our general conversation here. Towards the end of this program, you know, I'd love to have you summarize and maybe give each each one of you what are some of your predictions. Uh, but before we get to that point, uh, I have a question for you, Sumit. I know one of your research is also in the synthetic data. What, what is the problem we are trying to solve? Why do we need synthetic data? And can you throw some light on that? And then uh, Amy, if you want to add you know, your, uh, your research on that space, that'd be great. So Sumit? Well, so synthetic data, you know, when we talk about data for machine learning, right, mm -hmm. and that's kind of, you know, where we started as well in this, in this discussion. Um, so data is really the basic basis of anything where you're building in machine learning, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, when we look for, uh, uh, do we have sufficient data or not, right? Um, do we have the right data or not? Is it good quality or not? Um, is it from a trust, trusted source or not, right? So a lot of those questions, and if you don't have sufficient data, mm -hmm. uh, synthetic data seems to provide uh, an alternative. Um, it's still very emerging. Um, it's a new technology. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's uh, emerging. There are a lot of startups in this space. You know, there are very few who are, uh, uh, you know, who have um, customers at enterprise scale. Um, so definitely, you know, lot, a lot of work uh, that has to happen in this space, right? So, uh, but very exciting as well. So, you know, think of scenarios where, um, you know, maybe there's some proprietary data. data. Um, let's say, you know, it's an investment banking firm and they have a lot of um, uh, trade patterns and they don't want to share those uh, with the data scientists just you know, from, a, uh, from a, you know, pro a secrecy perspective or proprietary information perspective. Um, so then, you know, how do you use uh, machine learning? And if, if you cannot have good data, you cannot build a good model. And that's one of the scenarios where um, a synthetic data 
uh, where you can use existing data um, to create new data with similar characteristics uh, becomes useful. How, how do you do it? Right. So essentially, you know, you're training uh, models uh, based on existing data mm -hmm. and then using those models to generate new data. So mm -hmm. technologies like GANs uh, have a place as part of this, you know, Bayesian networks are included in here. Uh, but you know, essentially, you're training uh, a, you know a, a new machine learning model based on existing data, based on the characteristics that you want that model to learn, and then use it to generate you know brand new data, which is similar in in uh, profile, but wouldn't be exactly the same, hmm. right? And, and that's an amazing thing, right? Where now you're not limited to uh, where your data has to be in production only, and for a data scientist to access and build models, right? Or you can create a similar kind of um, uh, for copy, like something, you know, in the data space, I remember uh, we used to have these gold copies, hmm. right, which may be a year old in some cases. And, you know, you're kind of using that into, you know, to seed new, plant, new, new environments. Yeah. Uh, now you can have something with synthetic data to do that. That's great. So, you know, very exciting space, uh, definitely. Right. I, I think it's such a cool space and it is, <laughs> it is really, it is really interesting uh, and it's somewhat meta in a way. Um, so it's, <laughs> yes. it's, it's kind of a, a, a fun thing to even think about. I do have one, and I don't really have anything to, to, on the technology to add, cause it's not something that I'm, I'm super deep into my one worry about it. Uh, it just kind of in the back of my head is, is it going to be, is it going to make it harder to track down things like bias and, and unfairness, because you now have this extra layer of abstraction between original data, learn model, synthetic data. And if we don't do proper lineage, I, yeah, how are we gonna, you know, when we do find an issue, is it gonna be harder to troubleshoot? Is it gonna be harder to, you know, see the bias and the, you know, things like that. So that's the one thing in the back of my head. I'm like, I wonder, I, I can't quite figure out if that's, if that's gonna be an issue. Um, above and beyond just worrying about fairness, uh, you know, in our data and our algorithms to begin with. Oh, excellent point, Amy. Um, I mean, it can go both ways, right? You can argue that um, you know, if, you if you don't have balanced data set, you can use um, synthetic data to, to fill in that gap and make mm -hmm. your data more balanced. Mm -hmm. But if uh, that oversight is not there or that understanding is not there, then there is even a risk mm -hmm. of uh, enhancing the bias, right? Because you're using mm -hmm. uh, biased data set to generate more of that same data. And, and, you know, fair point on, on traceability and lineage and you know, just governance of the data. Um, okay. So, but I, I think we are at that stage right now where uh, the technology is being proven, uh, mm -hmm. the use cases are getting validated, right? That there is application for it. And, uh, and I think as the, the challenges that you just pointed out, right? As they become more, um, more and more um, you know, visible and people understand those, uh, the, uh, the, uh, repercussions of it. Right? Yeah. I think that's when we'll have uh, these governance layers come on top of it. So, so talking about, you know, the concern, like, you know, Amy brought out a uh, concern, just reminded me that there are quite a few very well-known personalities in the industry who've done amazing work. We look up to them, but they're just constantly, you know, uh, sending warning signals on AI, job losses, or taking over, like Elon Musk comes to my mind. I mean, e e Elon's, you know, such a visionary. What are, what are your thoughts on people who are sounding alarm bells on AI? I, I'm gonna jump in on this one because I, I I think it's it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying not to roll my eyes on on some of this, um, but it's a it's a double edged sword. Like I, I do think we need to talk about um, how do we trust, uh, how do we build in explainability, how do we check for fairness. I mean, these things need to be done. We need governance um, from the the data um, to the models, you know, to you know decisions um, that are that are made. Uh, mm -hmm. But I really. It really bothers me when um, anybody says this is too hard. Let's not do it, or you know they're gonna it, the, the sky's gonna fall and we're all going to be the slaves of robots um, because I, I think that can have a very um, it can have a very negative impact on people's behavior and they can kind of go well I guess this is hard I'm gonna wring my hands and just say 
I can't do anything about this. And I think that is the absolute worst outcome you could have. Uh, you do not want to, you know, have this, um, er I'm going to use erosion again, erosion of, of agency, this feeling that we don't have agency over and control over where we decide to take AI. Uh, and that to me is the part of responsible AI is that, you know, we have a responsibility to guide it uh, in a way that we feel is right for our society and our users. And it's hard, it's not gonna be easy. We're gonna get it wrong. Um, I'll probably be retired before, you know, we get halfway of where we need to be. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean you don't start and you don't incrementally, you know, make, make it better and have those conversations. So I don't know if that answered your question exactly, no, but this, this is, topic is, yeah. yeah it's brilliant. Important. Yeah, very well put, very well said. Sumit? Yeah, I'll add uh, one word to it, uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. That, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the technology, uh, there's a lot of technology that is there, right? But in the, at the end of it, I think there has to be that accountability established yeah. that if the AI is not performing well, or if it's, you know, biased or, you know, just not built the right way, uh, you know, who's accountable for it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and that comes as part of the governance, mm -hmm. right? Um, that are you using it the right way? You know, some of the ethics principles, um, you know, as well. Uh, to support uh, the use cases that are being selected, right? But I think uh, that's one piece that's been missing, right? Is that, you know, truly who's accountable for the actions of the AI model that's been built. Um, so- have we, reached a, have we reached a some consensus? Because, you know, we hear about this in if Uber has a self-driving car and there's still a driver and there's an accident, who is responsible? Who's liable for that accident? Is it Uber? Is it the car? Is it the AI developer? Is it the driver? What's the latest on that? Um, I don't have a really good answer for this one, Sanjeev. I, uh, just, yeah, this is. I, I think we are still talking about it. I think I think that that's why we need um, people. Any. Anybody who's impacted by AI, which is everybody, uh, right. needs to have a voice in and discuss what guidelines and regulations should be. Uh, everything from, you know, you want lawyers involved, you want ethicists involved, you want um, people who drive cars involved, you want, you know, you want, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, more diversity of the voices, you know, making and uh, recommending guidelines and regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I think the EU is ahead of the US mm -hmm. by I was going to say a year, probably a couple of years, uh, in in kind of putting out guidelines, and I do think we're going to see um, probably EU more possibly regulations next year around what it means to have more um, ethical AI. Um, probably should be called accountable AI or responsible AI, maybe. But but anyhow, um, but but we'll we'll see that, and we'll probably not see that in the US for I would say maybe two years would be my guess, or at least the discussions will be happening then. Um, I think we are starting to see some regulations come though. There's a New York um, regulation uh, against uh, AI hiring bias that looks like it's gonna happen next year. Uh, and so it's kind of, I see it kind of like GDPR and the, you know, first you saw the EU do something and then you saw uh, California do uh, something and we'll see these regional things happen. Um, but I don't think it's a big problem and I think it's going to take us a while and we're still in that conversation of who is accountable, which is, assuming, I think, a good, yeah. you know, a Amy, good I, wanted to ex that. I wanted to extend your point a little bit about EU uh, and I was just, uh, you know, doing some uh, work for my, this upcoming document. Uh, came across uh, a few examples there, especially uh, within uh, Netherlands, where they have a uh, city of Amsterdam, and I think there was one more city where they have uh, even defined uh, these algorithm registries, mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, for solutions, and, and these may be just, you know, solutions that the government agencies are building, they have to publish their algorithm as part of uh, the algorithm registry, right? So there's nice. going for a lot of transparency there. Right. And um, uh, there is an ombudsman there, a national ombudsman, who is looking at the concerns and complaints from citizens, you know, how the data is being used, uh, you know, sometimes without their consent and, you know, how um, the, the solutions are being built. So they're taking note of all those um, uh, questions that are coming up in the national conversation mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, trying to add more transparency to it. So I think 
uh, there's a lot of uh, initiatives that are happening in that space just to add transparency to how AI being how AI is being used. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I think I, I mean there's a lot of uh, yeah, there's a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I I'm really glad we brought up uh, the regulations because I think that is a huge uh, prediction that we are going to have these uh, these uh, regulations enacted, not just like debated, but I think we'll start seeing yeah. some of them come into force. So with that, you know, this has been an amazing conversation. We can go on for a long time, but you know, in the interest of time, uh, may, if we can summarize it, uh, Amy, if we want to start with you, like if you can just summarize what you see as 2022 predictions in the space of AI and ML. Sure, and I'll, I'll start with what we were just talking about was uh, responsible AI, I think, uh, is going to become more tractable. So more more practical tools, more guidelines to follow, and I think more regulations are going to get implemented, even if they're not all U.S., but in, in different areas and different regions. So um, responsible AI actually becoming more practical and, and actually guidelines to follow. Uh, I think um, we were talking about graphs for a little while. I think people are going to start leveraging contextual data um, more to kind of bring in holistic information. Uh, and then we were talking a lot about data and maybe not as much as we should have, uh, but I think data is just gonna be like cornerstone for ML. It's gonna be data, 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 data lineage, data governance, um, data cleansing, uh, data augmentation, um, <clears throat> synthetic data. Uh, so I think trust in data, if we go responsible AI has a big, data element to it as well. So I think data is, those would be my three prediction is that we're going to get sick, sick of hearing about data, um, yeah. <laughs> where people are going to do more contextual uh, understanding and then responsible AI, more practical. Excellent. Great. And Sumit? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to agree with everything that Amy said. Uh, you know, I, I do see that, you know, these trends will, uh, you know, maybe grow bigger in uh, the next year. Um, so it's, it's going to be, uh, an interesting year, right? With, uh, but I think um, there's going to be that balance between maturity and innovation, right? That we're going to see a lot, lot more of. So, you know, one side you have, uh, you know, the innovation uh, happening within the whole space of transformers, right? Or uh, self-supervised learning uh, using less data to build models, right? So that innovation is absolutely required. Um, uh, balanced with, you know, just, um, uh, integration of uh, these responsible AI techniques within MLOps, right? So not thinking of these as two separate things, but, you know, being able to say that, you know, MLOps, if you're building an automation or, you know, a CICD pipeline, it has to in integrate a lot of the responsible AI techniques, right? So I do see that merger of uh, the ideas happening. So Sumit, one last question. Do you see standards or uh, some sort of consolidation because right now there are so many MLOps uh, vendors and you know uh, most hyperscale cloud providers have their own ways of doing it. There's open source options. Is there any uh, prediction uh, or trend you see on simplification? Um, so I uh, kind of think about it as, you know, software development has done a lot of these things. Right, where we have uh, you know the DevOps frameworks, the tool sets that come from there. Right, so I, I guess it's you know it's like a sequel of the you know first part of the movie, where you know we have seen a lot of these challenges play out within within the DevOps space. Right, and now we are within the you know we are seeing that extension of uh, MLOps and see you know how it's going to go. So yeah. you know I, I I do hope that there's going to be some standardization that's going to come in place and some interoperability across different products. And, and there are you know, some of those standards in place, right? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of adoption of those uh, yeah. uh, techniques. That is great. Great, thank you so much. I am amazed we've done the whole program without mentioning even a single vendor, but we stuck to the concepts, the approaches, best practices, challenges, some lessons learned, trends and predictions. So thank you so much for coming on this show we could do this every week. Yeah, there's so much. In fact, uh, Amy started with mega trends, each trend, like MLOps <laughs> would be a whole episode by itself. So yeah. hope to have you back uh, in future. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Thank you Thanks, everyone. Yeah.